there is a sifting. And God is sifting the chaff from the wheat. But it's a, it's, a, it's a preparation for a greater harvest. It's a preparation for the, for the seedbed is being prepared. And it's like it we're coming into that season where the harvester will overtake the sower. The season is coming where the harvester will overtake the sower. And the seed, the beds are being prepared. There is a sifting in, in the harvest at the moment. There is a sifting. I believe this is, this is a, a worldwide thing, not just for us as a church. But God is doing something at a worldwide level that he's, 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 he's preparing the hearts of many. He's preparing the heart for the harvest. He's preparing. The prophetic word has come through again and again and again about a billion soul harvest, but God is preparing it. It's a season for the harvest to come in. It's a season for the harvesters to go forth. It's a season for the, for the preparation. And God is doing something in his sovereignty. It's out of the sovereignty of God, not by the works of men. He's preparing something that's bigger. Father, we thank you, we thank you, we honour you that you're working by your spirit, that you will have your way on the earth, that you will fulfil your plan and your purpose for your kingdom on this earth and for the harvest to come. And we thank you and we honour you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Spirit of God, we exalt you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can have a seat. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Wonderful, Jesus. I, I really do believe that we're in a very interesting time spiritually. It's so important that we have our eyes open to see what God is doing and not just look at circumstances. If we look at circumstances, we can become very reactive. But if we look to what God is doing and to the heart of the Father, we can see that there's something bigger going on in the heart of the Father. There's, some, there's a plan and a purpose and he's going to bring it to pass in Jesus' wonderful name. Alec, come and bring communion to us. The stewards, you can serve them. Um, I just wanted to let the Bible talk for itself with um, communion this morning. Um, so, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll go back a few hundred years before Christ <laughs> um, to Psalm 22. Um, starting from verse 8, it says, this is like incredible prophetic words of the coming Saviour. He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while I was on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Basham have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths, like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. The dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. Cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far from me. O oh my strength, hasten me to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns and the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. And it goes on, and it's just, it's really encouraging. And um, if you flick over to Isaiah 53, it, it, it kind of goes on to give more detail, and in some ways more details than even the Gospels um, portray. Um, things like, he is despised by men and rejected by men, a man of sorrow is acquainted with grief, and we hid our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. 
Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God. But he was wound, wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And he goes on a little bit further and says that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days. And he shall pleasure, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his land. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. And it goes on and on and on and just tells this incredible story of someone who wasn't even born yet. So then we fast forward a few hundred years and we get to Jesus. And what a coincidence, he comes and he fulfills all those prophecies and, and more, hundreds of prophecies. And in uh, I mean, it's Hebrews, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, it says, For we do not have a high priest, and Jesus is our high priest. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin, let us therefore come boldly to the throne room of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So we've got, we've got a God who has a throne room of grace prepared for us who are in him. And our high, high priest who, who intercedes for us is Jesus and he gave his life as the only worthy sacrifice. He lived a holy and blameless life on, on our behalf so that we, all we have to do is identify him and, in him and just say yes to the gift that he has for us. And the price that he paid was his, his blood and his body. And um, just like it's described in, in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, it wasn't pleasant for him, but it pleased the Lord to do it because he knew that all of us could sit here and stand here and be children of the Most High God and be co-heirs with Christ. And whether or we not deserve it, whether or not we deserve it, it's not the argument because the fact of the matter is he thought we were worth it as we are and right now, no matter what we did this morning, no matter what we did this week, no matter what we've done in our lives, we can come to the throne room of grace and obtain mercy from our King, who's also our friend, who's also our father, who's our brother. And we can just sit at the foot of the cross and just pour our hearts out to him. And it says that he's casted our sins as far as the east is from the west. So we can sit in that place of forgiveness and just drink of his mercy. So Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your sacrifice. Lord, help us to always remember what you did for us and what you say about us when shame creeps in. Lord, thank you that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your body that you offered up to the Father as a sacrifice for our sins. In Jesus' name, he may eat and drink. Amen. Thanks, Alec. That was great. Lovely. Well, this week is um, starting to rev up a little bit. Uh, we'll be meeting back here again next, uh, next Sunday morning. Just know that we have a prayer meeting before church uh, around 9.30. We're out there praying for our meeting and for the goodness of God to come and bless us all. Uh, and then at 10am, of course, we have our meeting here.
Tuesday night is our prayer meeting night as well. Um, Tom and I have been meeting at the Hub on Tuesday nights and it's been absolutely wonderful. So we'd like to encourage as many of you to come along as possible to join in with our prayer meeting. Um, the focus of our prayer is basically believing for the Sunshine Coach host to be radically touched by God. Um, if there's any particular um, significant prayer needs for our congregation, of course, we pray for you guys as well. Um, but we're just believing for a real move of God to come and, and just um, for God to have his impact on the Sunshine Coast, um, not just in our church but in all the, the churches and the people who don't yet know Jesus um, in our area. So that's basically the focus of our, um, of our prayer meeting. Uh, and Thursday is going to be a great day. Thursday morning at 10 a.m., Coffee Connections and Ladies Chats are having a joint launch for the year. Um, we're meeting down at the Spit in Park and Parade at Mooloolaba so that everybody can attend. It'll be outside. I'd like to thank Rosalie for organising this. Uh, it was such a great idea. So what you can do is you can grab a coffee, bring your own coffee, um, and if you want to bring a bit of morning tea or something, you can. Uh, also, if you want to stay for lunch, there's fish and chips available, obviously, across the road at the co-op, and you can all hang out and have a fellowship lunch together as well. So it's a really good opportunity just to connect again in a safe environment outdoors um, where everyone can just come and enjoy themselves. And then Thursday night, we're kicking off Women at the Well again this year, um, which I'm really excited uh, to be bringing back again. Uh, we'll be doing that every Thursday night. Uh, this week we'll be meeting at Karen's. If you want to get the address from me, um, please see me after the meeting and that'll be fantastic. Uh, now, we'd like to take up our tithes and offerings, if we could please, um, if the stewards could come. I am just so grateful. I'm just so grateful to God for his provision. And we see God providing in so many different ways in people's lives. We look around and we see the material things that we have, but we also see the healings. We see the, the blessing of God on people's lives. And it's sort of like God has a measure for each and every one of us, you know, and his measure is unending. He has a measure that is so great. And I just want to encourage us that as we give today to realise that the measure that we give back to him is just a sign of, I suppose it's our heart towards him. You know, we give with a grateful heart. God loves a cheerful giver. And as we give with a cheerful heart today, we just believe that God will just bless us so much as we are such a blessing to him. So, Tom, I'd like you to come up now and bring the message, which would be awesome. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Am I on? Yes. Wonderful, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your speaking to us this morning. Father, I pray that your word would be sharp and powerful and it would speak to us and help us in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Last week I spoke about when God speaks. And this week I want to speak about how we respond when God speaks. When God, you know, we have a living God. God is alive. Turn me down a bit, please, Jack. I feel like I'm echoing all over the place. And I've got a big loud voice, it doesn't need to be too loud. <clears throat> so, you know, we've got a living God. And it's out of a relationship with God that we have our walk with Christianity. When it comes back to just a religious activity and we do our duty and go to church, we miss the point. It's not about just doing religious duty. It's about a living relationship. It's about daily encountering God. It's about walking with God and allowing God to be our Lord and our Saviour and entering into that place. When God comes and he speaks to us, it brings life. Last week I spoke about when the angel spoke to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, her response was, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word, and the angel departed from her. Let me tie this thing down a little bit so it doesn't roll around on me. <clears throat> And she responded with an identity, the maidservant of the Lord, and she agreed with what God said. You know, <clears throat> the Spirit of God speaks with visions and dreams. Our mind is the canvas that God speaks on. And so if we've got our mind full of stuff, it's hard for God to put something else in there. It's hard to fill a cup which is already full. And so when we come into the presence of God, it's not a matter of being blank but allowing his word to speak to us. 
when I get into the presence of God and start to meditate on the Word of God, I find that the Spirit of God will begin to, the Word of God will begin to flow through me. And I'll get verses that bounce from here to there. And, and, and there's a, God will speak out of His Word. Of course, that can't happen if I haven't already read the thing. So I've got to get my face into the Bible to read the Word and allow God to speak to me from it. Allow it to become alive to me and, and fill me. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But when that word comes, we've got to know how to respond and how to walk with God in what he says to us. Is this making sense? You with me so far? We've got to respond rightly. <clears throat> now, the word that God gave Mary was pretty tough. She was unmarried. And so she spoke to, God spoke to her through the angel that she would have a child. She said, how can this be? I haven't known a man. But yet when God speaks to us, it's the same thing. When God spoke to Mary, Christ was formed in her as the Spirit of God overshadowed her. But when God speaks to us, Christ is formed in us. It's exactly the same. And so we've got to allow Christ to be formed in us. We are born again of the incorruptible seed of the word of God that lives and abides forever. That seed cannot be corrupted. It can be taken out. It can, it can dry and wither up, but it can't be corrupted. We are born again of incorruptible seed. <clears throat> it's a holy seed. Ephesians 4 says it like this. I'm created after God in righteousness and true holiness. I'm created in God's image. My inner man, my spirit man, comes alive to God and Christ is formed in me. This verse in Galatians says 4.19, My little children, Paul speaking to the Galatians, to the church of Galatia, for whom I labour in birth again until Christ is formed in you. And Christ needs to be formed in us. There's a process as Christ is formed in us, that nature and character of Christ. But it's not just the nature and character. There's a divine spark, there's divine power that can flow through us. The Spirit of God works with Christ, works with Jesus. And as Christ is formed in us, the Spirit of God can flow through Christ in us. Christ in me is the hope of glory. And when I have this identity with Christ, and shift from my identity to his identity, then the Spirit of God, something divine can happen so powerfully as he flows through me. I hope I'm making sense here. There, there is something powerful about the, the, the divinity of Christ in us and allowing Christ to be formed in us. Just as the Holy Ghost overshadowed uh, Mary, he overshadows us and comes upon us and that seed of the Word of God forms Christ in us. And we become the body of Christ. He is the head. We are his body. We are called Christians. We have his identity. We wash in his blood. We are filled with his spirit. And we have the identity and character and nature of Christ in us. We are partakers of his divine nature. We have the divine within us. And as that spirit is formed within us, we become like him. I think it's First Corinthians says, as we see him, we become like him. Out of that knowledge of what he's like, that's who we become. And the more we see Jesus, the more we become like him. Out of that nature, out of that compassion, out of that sweetness, out of the forgiveness, out of that authority, out of that identity in Christ. And the identity of walking in him it brings us into a place where we can walk in authority. But one of the things that happens is, before that, before we receive Christ, we grow up, we have parents that speak into us, we have teachers that educate us, we have experiences that put things into us, and we can be full of all sorts of stuff. We can have insecurity, we can have poor self-image. We can have hurts and offences and wounds. We can have all this stuff going on in our lives 
the when we receive Christ comes and he wants to deal with all this stuff so he can shine. But if I'm full of insecurity and I'm not confident in my identity and who I am, then my insecurities will come out. I've said a couple of times here, you know, just jokingly, that I'm incredibly good looking. But sometimes, you know, if you say some positive things, this is what happens in Australia. If you say some positive things about yourself, it can be perceived as arrogance and pride. Isn't that true? Okay, so if I say something like that, people say, oh, you're full of yourself. Isn't that how we respond as Australians? But yet, Psalm 139 says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And if I live out of the place of insecurity, that I'm not fearfully and wonderfully made, that if I have a poor self-image about who I am, if I have this negative going on in my world, from my experiences, from my past, from what parents have spoken into me or authorities have spoken to me, if I live out of this place of negative and brokenness, I can't carry the glory of God. I can't express the nature of Christ. Are you hearing this? And so there's this battle that goes on in our inner world for Christ to be formed in us because we've got all this other stuff that's going on. We've got offences, we've got wounds, we've got negativity, we've got hurt, we've got, you know, battling with, with this inner need for acceptance and, and for, you know, to be, to be wanted and, and for stuff. All this stuff going on in our inner world, but yet Christ wants to come and be formed in us with security and authority. They said about Jesus, look at this man, where does he get his authority from? How come he speaks with such authority? How come he speaks so powerfully? How come he can perform these miracles? Because he had the divine nature of God. How can he forgive these people that are so full of sin? How can he do this? A woman brought to him an adultery and he forgave her. They're supposed to stone them. How can he do this? How can he heal on the Sabbath day and do the things that were against the law? Because he had the divine nature of God within him. You and I have this same divine nature within us. But this old carnal nature, this old thing wants to speak all the time, this old insecurity that, that I'm no good, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I'm too ugly, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too tall, I'm too short, I'm too dumb, I'm too smart, I'm, I've got the twos going on. We have Christ in us. And when we allow Christ in us to be our identity, it doesn't matter what all the other stuff is. It doesn't matter. It does not matter about these externals that I'm being renewed day by day in my inner being. And I get the nature of Christ within me and my security is in Him. And my, my desire is towards Him then when the Spirit of God comes, he can flow through that divine nature and not through all my cracks and warps and beams and my too, too many stuff going on. It's not about who I am. It's about who Christ is in me. Christ in me is the hope of glory. It's him in me that is beautiful. You know, sometimes people say, you know, oh, it's not me, it's just Jesus. You know, somebody's singing beautifully and you go and say, yeah, that was so lovely. And they go, oh, it wasn't me, it was just Jesus. I'm thinking, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't reflect like that. We've got to be able to receive honour, otherwise how can we have a crown to throw at his feet? We've got to be able to receive it. Somebody gave us some honour last week and I deflected it and Deb rightly pulled me up. He said, we've got to be able to receive honour. We've got to be able to. But my, somehow or other, my insecurity didn't want to accept it. And I, I, I received what she said, and I said, no, thank you very much. But if I had have said, it's just Jesus, you know, when I'm on my own, I can go to Jesus and say, you know, thank you for what you've done in me. 
Thank you, it's your nature in me. But I've got to be able to receive it from people. If I deflect it and say it's just Jesus and I'm, there's somebody that can sing like an angel, I'm saying, and I say, oh, man, that was a beautiful song. They go, no, it's just Jesus. And I think, it's not that good. <laughs> if it was that, you know, it was Jesus singing, you know, universes would be created and all of it. <laughs> It's this thing. We've got to be able to receive and, and, and build one another. We've got to be able to encourage one another. The kingdom of God is full of honour. It's one of the values of the kingdom. But yet somehow or other in Australia we've got this thing where we like to flee. We like to pull down our tall poppies. Somebody successful will have a go at them. Man, and our media is relentless. Let's have a go at, there's a successful church. Let's have a go at them. Let's have a go at Hillsong because they're successful. They must be doing something wrong. Let's, let's try and, you know, yank the, the thing out from under them. All of us want the blessing of God, don't we? But yet when somebody else is blessed, all of a sudden we think, oh, geez, who are they? But yet that's the very thing we want. Or, or when... When somebody else is, is, you know, seems to be getting some traction. There's a whole bunch of verses about it. When somebody overcomes, and they, they, we think, how can they do that when they've been through that? And we bring the, the, the pistols out to criticize and condemn and judge. Hello? But the Bible says, don't judge. In the same measure that you judge, you'll get judged. The same measure, if you point the finger, it's going to come back at you. So, uh, you know, I am very, very careful about criticising the body of Christ because that belongs to Jesus. And it's his business to sort it out, not mine. I'm very careful about that. Because I know he can sort me out real good. <laughs> Hello? He can sort us out. That's his, he can do it, no problem. But we've got to allow Christ to be formed in us and allow the dreams of God to flow. Joel 2.28 says, The Spirit of God shall come, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. We've got to allow the dream of God to come upon us. We've got to allow the vision of heaven to be that which defines us. You know, sometimes it's so easy to get reactive about what the enemy is doing. And we shouldn't be unaware of what the devil is doing, what the strategies and plans are, and what governments can do. We shouldn't be unaware. But I think if I, that takes my focus, then I'm taking my focus off the kingdom. And I lose the vision, I lose the dream. And I've got a dream for Australia. I've got a, my desire is for a reformation. We want revival. And that's good where the church gets filled. We want people to be saved and get swept into the kingdom. We want the harvest. But I want my nation to be influenced with that revival. I don't want it to stop there. I want us to be able to have the influence go right through every culture of society, every sphere, every part of it, that, the, that, 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 that there would come righteousness back as the core values of our nation. And what's right before God, not just what right before everybody that feels like they want something. So don't get offended about this and that and something else. But what's right before God? Because I can tell you, some things are offensive to God. But because we can't see him, some people don't care. But yet that's righteousness. We've got to pursue righteousness and what's right before God. I've got a desire to see families, you know, that are so fractured, bring in and, and the, 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 the oil of the gospel of reconciliation, healing those fractures and healing the wounds that happen in relationships. So, so there, there's offences not driving division all the time. I've got a desire for our nation to, to embrace the values of heaven and, and to be reformed. So, so it's a, a nation that's influenced with the gospel. The way we do business. And the, one of the big things that I've mentioned already is about honour. 
Australians are pretty good, you know, if we're, we, we show our friendship by taking the mickey out of our friends, taking a piece out of them. Isn't that an Australian thing to do? Yeah, yeah. But it's not kingdom. And I believe that the kingdom of God, if we're going to represent the, the kingdom of God, it's got to start with us. <laughs> yeah, it's got to start somewhere. It's got to start with us. The people who lift one another up. The people who rejoice when somebody is doing well rather than trying to cut them down to our size and make them smaller. Who are grateful when, when people are blessed and, and, they, and they're just flourishing. We've got to have a heart to encourage and build one another, to have a heart to see the, the goodness of God flow on the earth. So we've got to have a dream and allow the dream of God to, to fill us, to overflowing and not lose heart and not lose our vision, not lose our dream. Joseph was a dreamer. And if you read the book of Genesis, you would have read the story about Joseph, who, who was one of the youngest of 11 brothers. I think he was a prince or something rather. And, and he was a dreamer. And he had a dream that the sun and the moon and the stars would bow down to him. And his brothers understood what that dream meant. It says, the brothers and mum and dad are going to bow down to you. And they said, here comes the dreamer. And they plotted to get rid of him. They sold him into slavery. He told mum and dad that he'd been killed. Dad went into grief. Affected him so badly he went blind. Went into grief. But he was sold into slavery. And in slavery, he was sold into an Egyptian household, Potiphar. Now, Joseph's natural gift was administration. And he ended up administering at Potiphar's household. Potiphar's wife liked the gift on him and wanted to control the gift, so she set him up for, a, you know, put him in a position where she would have been able to control him. He fled away, so she accused him of trying to seduce her. He ended up in prison. In prison, his natural gift flourished again. He ended up administering and running the prison. I mean, how does a prisoner do that? It was his gift. So he ended up running the prison. He was administering this whole thing. But he kept a connection with God. And it's the same thing for you and I. We can have a dream and it can look like nothing is ever going the way it's planned or nothing is supposed to, you know, how on earth is God going to bring this to pass? I've got a dream for my nation. It's been going in me for a few decades now. And I really don't know how... We're going to get there, but yet it's a dream from God. I know that. And it was, there was a time when it was just so squashed I couldn't even think about it. But it's something that God has placed in me for our nation, for Australia, for the Sunshine Coast, for this church, that we represent the kingdom of God. I've got a desire for that. you just got to touch me and it comes out. It, 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 it's my heart that will represent the kingdom. Joseph was in this in a prison and he was administering with his natural gift. The butler and baker of the king came along because, you know, they had a dream and they knew that Joseph could interpret dreams because he still had this connection with God and was still able to understand in the spirit what God was doing and see. And we've got to be people who see what God is doing, not just looking at the natural. If we don't see what God is doing, it can get depressing. Because the natural will crush you. Are you hearing me? We've got to be people of the Spirit who hear the voice of God. And so here was Joseph and he interpreted the butler's dream and he interpreted the baker's dream. One didn't have a real good outcome. Sorry, mate, you're losing your head. The other one was, you're going to be restored back to your place. And exactly as he said is what happened. And he said to the fellow that was restored, remember me, when you get back there into the king's household. And it wasn't until two years later that the king had a dream, Pharaoh. He had a dream that just upset him so much. And it was a dream from God because it happened several times. He had it again and again and again. And they brought all the smart people, you know, all the astrologers and the astronomers and the new ages and the, and the bone pointers and whoever they had to try and figure out what's going on with his dream. 
and the the butler says, oh, there's a man in prison who understands dreams. We'll get him. The Pharaoh called for him. He said, this is the dream. This is what it means. This is what you do about it. So not only did he understand the dream, he understood the interpretation, but he also had the strategy from God that was out of his natural gift. So we can have a natural gift. Now, if, if he had never kept his connection with God to interpret, he would have just stayed in his natural gift and would have been stuck running the prison. And it's the same with you and I. We can have a natural gift, but if you only stay within your natural gift and lose your connection with God, the divine cannot come upon us. But the, he, he, he kept the connection with God. He had the strategy from God. And so Pharaoh says, okay, you're an administrator. You can administer this program for the whole nation. You're second only to me. And he went from running the prison to running the nation. And he administered. And if you read the story, the whole wealth of the nation came through his hands. And God set it up. So not only did he save his own family when there was a time of famine, he saved the whole nation in the time of famine. And the wealth of the nation came into the king's household. 400 years later, that wealth was transferred back to the Israelis as they left. So God has a strategy. And oftentimes it's bigger than what you and I can see. It's generational. But it's so important that we tap into what God is saying and doing and be people who can understand and we might only be just doing 1%. We might only just be, but a hundred of us, that's a full picture. <laughs> we might only be doing one step. What can I do? Well, I've just got to do my bit. But if I don't do my bit, somebody else has God's got to raise up to do my bit. And we've got to have a heart that stays connected with the Father, to hear the voice of the Father and do my part and allow the, the grace of God to come upon it. See, that transformed that whole nation. But he was just a boy who was a dreamer. And yet in his later days, when his brothers and his mum and dad came and bowed down before him and fulfilled that dream, he knew God has taken me through this to save you. And he didn't persecute his brothers for selling him into slavery. But he understood this is the plan of God and he followed the process. And he didn't allow bitterness to rule his heart because of the difficulty. And sometimes the difficulty of what we go through can speak to us and it will derail us if we allow it. We can allow the difficulty of our circumstance to pull us out of kingdom purpose because that speaks louder than the dream. Our insecurity can speak louder than the dream. Our offence can speak louder than the dream. Our hurt can speak louder than the dream. Circumstances can speak louder than the dream. Situations can come and we become reactive rather than sitting focused on the dream that God has given us and the heart that God has given us and the thing that God wants to fulfil by His Spirit. We've got to be people who stay connected to God and allow the dream to drive us rather than reacting. It's like the ten wise, ten virgins, five were wise and five were foolish. The wise ones had more oil than they needed. They stayed connected with the oil giver. They stayed connected to that one who pours out from heaven. They stayed connected to the dream. They stayed connected and allowed the vision to stay alive within them. They didn't just dry up. They didn't allow their oil that was burnt, you know, you know what oil does? It, it, it keeps your flame burning. It's what lets your light shine. And if you don't have plenty of oil, the light just dwindles. And you get 
Now for that. So we've got to have plenty of oil. We've got to have more than we need for ourselves. If, if you don't want more friends, your vision is too small. I've got such a big vision, I don't know how we're going to resource it because it's more than all what I've got. But God, if, if it's your vision, you're going to make way. Are you hearing me? If you don't have a desire for more, if your vision is, is, within, is, is not bigger than you, I think you need to go back to God and get a bigger one. So somehow or other, God has designed us to be carriers of his presence and his vision and his glory so that he's got to show up to do it. We're partnering with him. It's a, it's a bigger thing. And, and if God has got to show up and has got to be dependent on God, then God can shine forth his glory through you. Are you hearing me? You've got a vision for your family. I've got a vision for my family, for my kids. I've got a vision for them that God would touch them powerfully and move upon them. And, and you know, one of my daughters married a fellow who doesn't want anything to do with God. I can see him preaching the gospel. That's my vision. Totally opposite to where he's at. So, God. God, you've got a bigger thing. You won't allow me to talk to him, so. We've got to have a vision where, where God has got to do something. And it's got to be bigger than us. Don't allow your vision to get squashed. Don't allow the, the thing that God has placed within you to get redirected. Don't by, by circumstances or by you know, our, our lack of, of, of Christ within us. We've got to stay connected to the, to the dream giver, to the spirit of God and allow him to come upon us so that we can rise into who he's called us to be and what he wants us to do and be. We may not have much energy to go and do anything, but friends, what we should be is people of faith. And out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And when the vision is in your heart, then you speak out of that vision. That's what I'm doing now. And then the, the power of God can flow through that faith and create the, that thing which God has placed within you. That's how faith works. That might be a message for another day. But this is how we work with God, how we respond. Lord, be it unto me according to your word. I hide that word in my heart. I speak out of that word. And we may go through a process and a season and a time when God it doesn't look like those things are happening, but yet I'm going to hold on to the vision that you have given me because it's your vision, not mine. And God, you're going to make way somehow. I don't know how, but God, you're going to do it. I don't know how, but the vision is worth it. I don't know how, but our people are worth it. Our nation is worth it. It's Sunshine Coast is worth it for somebody to believe for this place and somebody to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth and see our place change because it's worth it, friends. It's worth it. Our people are worth it. You are worth it. You are worth it. Jesus looked at the cross and he said, for the joy that was set before him, I'll go through this. He was looking at you and he said, you are worth it. He looked at you and said, you are worth it. I'll go through this for you. That's what he said. He said, I'll go through this because the vision is worth it. We're worth it. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're worth it. You're worth it, right? You're worth it. You are worth it. Really, you are worth it. You're worth it. You are worth the blood of Jesus. The most powerful most costly purchase price that has ever been paid, the blood of the Son says you are worth it. We are worth it. And the people around about us, the people that are full of pain 
that are full of uh, nasty ones. God gives their worship. Because the Christ hasn't been formed in them yet. But when he does, he'll shine forth, he'll be transformed. And his coming off is worth it. And a lot of good in him. We've got to allow Christ in us. The dream of God to come upon the Christ in us. That the divine power and life of what he wants to do can flourish. Don't, what's the word? Don't, what's that word? It says, you know, don't despise the day of small beginnings. Don't despise if you think your dream is just small. Don't despise if you think, oh, what I believe in, you know, that's not a big thing. I tell you, it's a big thing to God. Because he's the one that's critical. It's big. You might just be able to cry. You might just be able to, you know, help the neighbour next door. I visited my family this week. They've got to see a mum and hearing said a good visit. And thank you for allowing us to do that. I went and spent some time with my sister. And she says, you know, it just, it just makes a little difference. And sometimes, she says, it's just going and making somebody smile. Don't despise the small things. We're in this together. Out of the body. Father, I thank you for your, for your presence. I thank you for your word. I thank you. God, for the dream. For the dream. For the dream. Father, you've given us a dream. You've given us a, a, a something to place within every one of us to, to just be able to see your, your glory come upon our families, upon our friends, upon our neighbours, upon our sunshine coast, upon this nation. Father, you've given us a dream. We thank you. We honour you for it. We love you for it in Jesus' lovely name. We pray, Father, that somehow or other you'd lead us step by step by step into it, that you'd make way for us, that, that every hindrance would be broken, Every negativity would be cast down. Everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ would come down in Jesus' name. And Father, we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' lovely name. Amen. And amen and amen and amen. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Spirit of God. Thank you, Spirit of God. Thank you, Spirit of God. Yeah. I've been preaching on this, on the dream, and again, I feel like there are people that are, that are that you feel like it's slipped out of your hand. It's gone. It was there, but it's gone. It's like some people are saying, well, I don't know what my dream is. I want to just release faith over you to, for, for that life of God to flow afresh, to fill your oil afresh. Holy Ghost. Catch you, please come allow me to pray with you. Just come. How many just believe God with you and let his life and the spirit of it to flow over you? Amen. You can sing it for this, straight to clear. Dorothy says, some says a, a number of here. It's like that vision. God, that dream. God, bring it alive afresh. Bring it a, bring it afresh. Bring it afresh. Bring it afresh. Bring it afresh. Come on, there's, there's a few here. I'm certain of that. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Bring it afresh to his life, bring it afresh to his mind, bring it afresh into his heart. Spirit of God, I speak to you watching today. I encourage you, do not lose heart. Do not lose the dream that God has placed within you. There is a divine unction and a divine spark that he wants to release. I release it to you right now. I release the anointing to you watching. I release the power of God to you for that dream to come alive afresh, for God to have his way. He's going to begin to burst some things within you. There are some of you watching here and it's like there's, there's a spark. You've dreamed about things that seem so, so out there, so wild, so, so far beyond where your circumstances are. You think, how can this be? But yet I encourage you, allow God, for the fire of God to come upon you and let it burn afresh within your heart. Father, release it to them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a fantastic day. Friends, just appreciate you all so much. We're in this together. Stay connected. Allow Jesus to be Lord. Allow him to love on you and love on one another. God bless you. Amen.